A reader lives a thousand lives before he dies. The man who never reads lives only one. Come into the reading room, all you lovers of language and literature. This is the place for those of us who believe that reading is essential as we seek to rise above the ordinary. And the reading room contains a host of extraordinary people, leading lights of the written word. Authors, literary critics, columnists and ideas people will tantalize your minds with their wordplay while discussing the ideas and worldviews that form our wonderful literary milieu. Come step into a world of magic, the place of undiscovered treasures, a room of reading. And it's into the reading room we go and with one of our favorite wordsmiths here in South Africa who we've had on the podcast before. We're getting her back to find out what she's been doing during lockdown and what she's been writing about and what she's been reading. Of course, it's Paige Nick all the way from Cape Town. How are you doing today? Hello, I'm so happy to be here. So fun, we get to talk about books. That's the whole thing, is that uh, <laughs> <laughs> books are us, I think we should just be called, because I know, I mean, you are an avid reader. I mean, how many books do you get through a week? Not enough. Is it ever enough? Shoes, books, is it ever enough? You know, what do they say? You can't be too rich, too thin, or have too many books. <laughs> I, I totally agree with that. I mean, but I've gotten to the stage. Do, have you got an overflowing library, by the way? Or do uh, have you, are you very good at keeping it kind of encapsulated, where you keep only the books that you could never get rid of? Or do you just have like hundreds of books all over? I'm better than I was. <laughs> I better you know they, don't they say you have to acknowledge your problem I my hi my name is Paige I have a book problem <laughs> they are everywhere I have piles I wanted to do a Twitter update the other day but it was a bit coarse to say um I've got piles <laughs> there are piles <laughs> of books everywhere I'm, I'm much better at getting rid of them once I've read them than I used to be I used to have this weird thing where I needed to keep every single book I ever read and mm -hmm. then when I moved a uh, house um, eight years ago, I thought this is ridiculous. I can't take. I'm never going to read these again. So now I'm quite straight. I'm not quite Marie Kondo. Didn't did she say something ridiculous like you can only have five or something? That's oh, no. is that even? It's inhumane. That's not. It's impossible. Can't survive that. Yeah. So now I'm very strict. If I think I'm going to read it again, or if I absolutely loved it. Um, I keep it and I also keep a lot of the South African books because I know the authors and I feel close to them and I don't want to let them go. But I'm giving away a lot of books right now. Like as I read them, then I, I want other people to read them too. So I, I feel I'm getting better, but it's the unread piles now that are taking over my life. Do you have the same thing? I, I have at the moment, and I'm so glad that libraries have opened again. I know that we could go on a whole thing about libraries, but I do like my library. But I also fortunately have a friend who has lots of books, and she just passes them on to me as she's read them. But those are the books, I mean, obviously I can give them back. Unless yeah. I really, really love it, then I will go out and get a copy so I can keep it. And that's my thing, is that I will only keep the books, as you said, that I've loved, and then I know I will read again. And then I can sit there in my lounge and look at my bookshelf and run my eyes over the books and immediately go into this complete literary world because I remember the story of every single one of the books that are on my bookshelves. It's such a funny thing that we want to own the ones we love, regardless of whether we're going to read them again or not. You just want to, it's like a safety thing. You just want to have them there, right? Absolutely. And I mean, if I had to leave and go anyway, all my books are coming with me. Yeah. <laughs> Or at least a select 300. <laughs> There's also, well, do you mm. know, do you store them by, a lot of people store them by alphabetically or um, some people do it by color. But mine are just kind of ramshackle everywhere, but somehow I know where they all are. It's by genre. Ah, you do by so genre. I, don't, I do it by genre. So I've got my Beat Generation stuff. I've got the sci-fi stuff. I've got the, you know, the Bill Brysons. I've got their own shelf, you know, that kind ah, of thing. Oh, you're very organized. The I've got like a South African and, section and then just piles, mm -hmm. really. Oh, yeah, no, I have a South African section as well. And one of your books is actually in that pile as well. Yoo-hoo, fangirl. Right. Uh, so, but it's interesting what you say about South African writers because, I mean, you're very involved. With, what's it, the, the Book Appreciation Society? Yeah. The Good Book Appreciation Society, yeah. Yes. It came up the other day about South African female crime writers. And yes. somebody was asking about, you know, who are your favorites? And it was something that I sat there and I thought, okay, fine. Well, the only two that I've actually read and have met and I, I really like is Margie Orford and Sarah Key. 
Oh, amazing. We we have so many. We have so many options. I love it when posts like that come up on the Good Book Appreciation Society because you can almost store that list. You know, say you're a crime fan mm. and you haven't heard a lot of a lot of these names. You can only kind of read one book or two or three books at a time, but you want that list for next time you go to get a voucher or next time you want to go and buy some books or next time you're in a secondhand bookshop. And then you can go back, search for crime writing and find that list and kind of hold on to it. Or I think a lot of people also take photographs on their phone. Do you have that thing? I have that thing sometimes where I walk into a bookshop and suddenly my brain is empty. I know there are 50 books I want to read, yeah. but I can't remember in the moment, you know, which ones there are. I have that with everything in life. <laughs> Even going to the, the grocery store. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I walk into a room, what am I doing here? <laughs> <laughs> yep, and we I'm used to laugh so. at our parents when they did yeah. that. And, and now yeah. we're you know, sitting there thinking, oh, my goodness, I'm turning into my mother. Uh, it's us. Now it's us. It's but our I, turn. But it, I love, I mean, you, you talk about South African um, writers. And a lot of people sit there and they don't know who a lot of the South African authors are, unless, of course, we do belong to a thing on Facebook or a club. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, but, I mean, you just take Dion Mayer, for instance. I mean, I, I think his stuff is absolutely fantastic as well. Yeah, he's incredible. He's incredible. I mean, Michelle Rowe is amazing. She's a South African crime writer, very talented. Also, um, Fiona Snikers and Gail Schimmel van Olselen and Kate Sidley have just launched um, some cozy mysteries. It's not yeah. it's crime, right? But with cats. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. So we have some amazing uh, crime writers here. Oh, Joanne Hitchens um, yes. did a wonderful series of, of her crime stuff. is also quite like dark and gorgeous. I love that stuff. Yeah, no, I, I'm always looking for new ones, and I'm so glad that they actually now are keeping them in the libraries as well. In case you don't know what they've written about when, or somebody's mentioned it and you're not too sure, then you can always go and get it from there and then, and then buy it because you want to keep it. <laughs> yes, I've got to tell you, I just read a book. You just reminded me, not that I need to be reminded because I'm still thinking about it. It's called The Artist Vanishes and it's by Terry Westby Nunn and it's just come out. It's a penguin book. It's, it's sort of crime but more thriller and um, she, it's got two parallel threads, a then thread and a now thread. And the then thread is about this artist who does these very cultural art pieces. And she mm. she gets a grant from Big Pharma and she does a project about testicles, a very interesting project. And she suddenly hits it big time. She was a struggling artist and she hits it big time. Then she goes in with this Big Pharma for a second project and it goes horribly wrong and somebody ends up dying and she disappears. And nobody knows where she's gone. There are lots of suspects for the death of this guy and also for her disappearance, obviously because Big Farm is involved. Then the other thread is the now. And um, this documentary maker moves into an apartment and realizes it was an apartment she lived in before she disappeared. And he decides to write a documentary about her disappearance. And he's kind of washed out. He plays the role of the cop. Normally it's the cop who's kind of an alcoholic washed out, you know. Mm -hmm. And so he goes on this uh, adventure to kind of unravel her disappearance. It's fantastic. I loved it. So if that's kind of your if thriller kind of crime is your um, genre, then you should look out for The Artist Vanishes by Terry Westby Nunn. She's an amazing author. It's her second novel. I'm definitely going to go and have a look for that one. I'm just going back to Dion Mayer again. I see that he, he got the Knight in the Order of Arts and Letters in France. How cool is that? I mean, over in, in Europe, that his books are that big as well. Can you believe it? It's incredible. When I think of somebody, it's a weird thing, but when I think of somebody being a knight, I imagine, remember the story with the sword in the, in the stone? Yes. Like I instantly picture that he can now go and get the sword out of the stone. <laughs> <laughs> your, henceforth, your name will be Arthur. That is a good name for a magician. Yeah. <laughs> you are, I shall knight thee, lord of the books, knight of the books. <laughs> no, he's fabulous. incredible. And you know what? He's just the nicest. I went to, I did an event once and um, he was kind of running the event. It was a full charity event. And he interviewed me and I was shocked at he'd really like done his homework. He definitely read the books and he was so generous. I was like, this guy's like so super famous. How did he find the time to do that? He was, he's very invested in everything that he does and he takes it all very seriously and he's incredibly kind and professional. I'm a, I'm a massive fan. I think he's mm. amazing. But you do quite a lot of interviewing of authors as well, don't you? Yeah, and I'm starting to do more of it. At the moment I'm not writing so much. I'm not busy writing books, so that kind of opens up time to do more promoting of books. 
So uh, I don't know if you ever, if you read Rachel Joyce's uh, latest, I think it was last year, or maybe the, the years have kind of, this last year has gone a little murky for me, but she wrote Miss Benson's Beetle, which yes. is my read of the year last year. It like, it was such an escape when we were so locked in. And then they asked me to interview her. So that was um, um, for exclusive books, I think. And that was incredible. So I'm doing a mm. bit more of that, that interviewing stuff, which is a bit more hairy, scary, but uh, it's really interesting. And the authors tend to be interesting to talk to, you know, easy to talk to on the whole. Unless you go too literary, then it's not so oh, easy to talk to. Until you get too many. literary, yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> then they're much harder to talk to. <laughs> yeah, and then you sit there and you think, oh, sure, sweat oh, on the God. forehead. What am I going to yeah. do now? Yeah, uh, it's out of my pay grade. <laughs> <laughs> Way above, yeah. <laughs> Especially when they start throwing. It's okay if they throw the big words. Then you just have to remember what the big words are to throw back again. Yeah, that, exactly. That's always the thing. Suddenly and you mirror do, oh, their body language. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You're quite right about that. Now, you say you haven't been writing. What have you been doing then? Well, I have a day job. My day job is in advertising. So I write every day, all day, but I'm writing advertising. So that's always been my day job. And then I write on the side. So I've done some columns um, in the last year for Sunday Times. I always kind of write columns on and off for them. And um, I'm trying my hand at writing a series because I'm interested in different forms so i've tried my hand at novels and done a few of those and really enjoyed it and um, i like watching series so um uh, so i'm trying to write and and we'll see what comes out of it short stories you've been writing those i'm not very good at short stories and um funny you should mention it a book landed on my desk called mad honey by sj nordir and it's translated from the afrikaans and his first a book which I'm not going to remember the title of, Birds, something about birds, forgive me, um, has won lots of awards and he's a very talented writer. So I read these short stories, they're called Mad Honey, and I, they're incredible. He is such a talented literary author. But I started grappling, like, and I love the journey of them, but I grapple a lot with short stories. I generally read them between big novels. You know, you read a big novel and then you kind of have a book hangover because it was so good that you don't know what you're going to read next. So actually I had read The Artist Vanishes that I just told you about mm. and I wasn't ready to get into another book. So I thought short stories will be perfect. And I picked up this Mad Honey and I read them and I love them. But I'm not a good short story reader or writer because I have this expectation that short stories should just be like mini novels and you the end is resolved. Mm. But most short stories, that's not the form. Short stories are kind of a slice of life and they don't always resolve. So now I've gotten into this thing where I think if I read more short stories, I might understand the form a little bit better. And so I've started kind of reading short stories. Um, there are a lot of new collections out. Sofiso Mzobe has got Searching for Simpiwe out, which I'm halfway through. Mm -hmm. Fred Kumalo has got another, a new one that's just come out called The Coat of Many Colors. And then I loved Shabnam Khan. They're not, they're essays more than short stories. So fiction and nonfiction. Shabnam Khan has this uh, book out called How I Accidentally Became a Global Stock Photo. It's brand new. It's brilliant. She entered a project and she had her photograph taken. And next thing she knew, she was a global stock photo and she'd signed all her rights away. And her photograph kept appearing in all these advertisements all over the world. Mm -hmm. And then she went on this journey to try and get lawyers involved and try and get her rights back for this photograph that was appearing in every imaginable place on magazine covers everywhere. So um, that's the, the title story, but it's full of amazing essays. So yes, so I'm reading sh lots of short stories. I don't know, are you a short story reader? Do you get them? I do occasionally. I love Richard Broutigan. He uh, I can't remember something about tales of fishing and hunting. Um, and they were wonderful because they do, they, some of them were slice of life, some of them did resolve, but I just loved his way of writing because he was coming out of the kind of the beat generation in a way. So uh, I loved that. Yeah. But um, he, he also was one of the people who did that whole writing a short story in 55 words. Uh. Do you remember that and whole thing that happened was, where everybody was yes. trying to write stories in 55 words? Yes, and then there were the other ones that were in, in six words or even much shorter. Do you remember yes. that? Yes, and that, the, the, uh, the lovely one, that one, the, I think that won some awards somewhere. It was what, baby shoes, never worn. Barely worn. Uh, for, baby shoes for, for sale. sale. For sale. For, yeah, yeah, baby shoes for sale, barely worn. Yeah. 
Or, or and that just tells the entire story. Worn. Oh, my God. It's devastating. Incredible that in six words. And then I remember on Twitter, that was really big. People were doing a lot of six word stories on Twitter. Mm. But I suppose you have to be really ruthless in the same way that you get rid of books. <laughs> you have to be getting rid of words as well to be able yeah, to set true. yourself that target of writing either in six or in 55 words. There's that comedian uh, whose name I'm not going to remember who often comes to South Africa and he, uh, he's quite crude and he laughs. He's got a ridiculous laugh like a horse braying. I can't think of his name. But he's Jimmy tried Carr. to get the art of – yes – He's tried to get the art of telling uh, jokes down to as few words as possible. He does a whole a whole piece about it where he gets them down to as few words as possible. And then he, he has one that's just one word, and I'm going to be very disappointing because I'm not going to remember it. <laughs> what the word was. Maybe I'll Google it while we're chatting and see if I can find it. No, bite-sized fiction is actually nice, and I, but I suppose... It's more from the contemplative point of view rather than actually in, in getting absorbed in a story. I mean, it's very clever. It's very readable. And, and it's a funny thing, you know, short stories, when you're a kid, you would rather read a short story because you don't have time. You're so busy outside because playing. Because you're lazy. Or all lazy, yeah. <laughs> Except I just used to. Because you'd rather be gaming. <laughs> no, I, not, when I was a kid, though, I just wanted to be reading. Um, nothing else actually took over yeah. from the reading. And, but as you get older... I think you want to be more engrossed in something because if you're going to do it, then if you are a reader, then you want to read a whole book. But but what you said is a nice, yeah, a little palate cleanser in between, a little bit sorbet for a short story in between would be a good thing. Yes, but I put that on Facebook because I, I had wanted to chat to people in the Good Book Appreciation Society about short stories and whether people think they're too vague at the end or if they don't mind when they're vague at the end. And I'd said that I thought that for me they were a sorbet. And so many people, a publisher of Majaji Books, Colleen Higgs, came back. She said, that for her, they're not a sorbet. The form itself is so important to her mm -hmm. that she invests in them as she would with a book. So I guess it's somewhere between poetry. Some of them can be somewhere between poetry uh, and novellas. And um, I thought this was a really, because I've been trying to educate myself a bit more about short stories. They're not my, it's not my wheelhouse at all, in my wheelhouse at all. And so I'd ask somebody, why do you think short stories are so vague at the end in general? And um, Ronelle Hart Jaspin, who's a member of the club, she said, I read short stories mostly as slices of life or lives of the characters they're peopled with. Something happens, there's a consequence or a series of events triggered, and we get to hear how a character or characters make sense of it and fit it into their narratives, changing a little or not at all, and then their lives carry on. I often feel that short stories are much more true to life, you know, than, mm. than novels. And I thought that was quite interesting. A lot of people resonated with that. But I like the idea of what they, they call it the flash fiction, which is, yeah. it, you, it started off with up to about 750 word count, which is about a magazine article length. And then the whole, yeah. the whole extreme writing came, thing came in on 55 words. So, I mean, what is the actual definition of a short story, though? I mean, how long, how many words would you say it would be? Anything between six I and no a idea. thousand? I don't know either. Yeah, but I mean, sometimes they go even longer. Um, in that, um, the Mad Honey, S.J. Nordea, one of the, and often in a short story collection, one of the short stories will be much longer than all the others, you know? Mm. So I don't know that there is a, I mean, they obviously can't run to tens of thousands of words, but I don't know. And the form is so interesting because for me, there's a line where it's too vague. A short story can be too vague at the end mm. or on the other side of the line is very resolved. But I don't know as a writer, I wonder how you know where that, where that line is. Different writers, I suppose, cross the line in a different place. Some want to write the very vague, open-ended ones and others go more kind of controlled and, and loose ends tied up. I'm very fascinated by this right now. Yeah. I'm, I actually must sit and read them again. I think it would be very, in, yeah, change, because I'm so used to reading long novels, and I, mean, I think I, with the last time we chatted, we discussed the fact that it was very difficult at first during the beginning of lockdown to read, to actually get yes. involved in a book. And I think we were all yes. doing everything in bite-sized pieces. Apart from television, of course, which we were just like, you know, downloading everything. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. You can binge watch for 18 hours, but an hour is too long to read. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's exactly what happened. That is so bizarre. And I notice, and I don't know if it's, you know, that thing when 
I mean, I'm not pregnant and I've never been pregnant, but you know that thing where if you're pregnant, you suddenly see everyone around you is pregnant or if you buy a certain car, then you suddenly see that car everywhere. So I don't know if it's that case of that, but now that I'm kind of investing a little bit in short stories and trying to figure them out, I'm seeing them everywhere. And I feel like they're bringing out a lot more short stories right now than they did maybe three years ago. And I wonder if that isn't a sign of how... Our reading habits are changing, particularly now with COVID, and uh, you know people may be more open to shorter pieces. You mean people with short attention spans? Yeah, I think so. Which might also might not just be COVID; it might just be the you know where we're at right now. Mm. And then I picked up because I'm seeing them everywhere. Two days ago, I picked up this book. It's called Umama. and it's not new. It was it was published in 2009. Yeah, 2009, it's Recollections of South African Mothers and Grandmothers, compiled mm. and edited by Marion Keane. And I thought for Mother's Day, I hope my mother doesn't listen to this before Mother's Day because I'm going to give it to her. Um, so what it is, is it's um, essays, and essays and short stories, are they similar? I guess one's fiction, the other's nonfiction. And what yes. they are is um, 40 famous South Africans it, um, talking to their mothers and grandmothers. So it's their stories. Um, so Nelson Mandela's, a uh, whole essay on Nelson Mandela's mother, Trevor Manuel, Zakes and Da, um, Pam Golding, Andre Brink, so many, Yvonne Shaka Shaka. Um, and it looks fascinating. So um, Anki Kroch. That is a good one. I'm just sitting there and thinking, how did they speak to Nelson Mandela's mother? Yes, and that's the, the one that I started reading, and it's in the first person, which kind of fascinated me like when and this was 2007 so somebody's gotten a first person narrative from Nelson Mandela's mother starts I was born on 18th of July 1918 at Mveso a tiny village on the banks of Mbashe River in the district of Mtata so it's first person Mm. um just this little piece which which I was like fascinated by um because she passed away uh, quite a while ago. Yes. <laughs> so I wondered how they got to that. Yeah, no, that sounds like, uh, you know, it's nice when people come up with something different as well. And, and you know, yeah. I think a lot of people when they're writing are slightly derivative. And I always think of the movies where somebody is a literary critic and then the p- person who whose books they've criticized come and are really nasty to them and this, that and the other because they didn't like the book. But because she says, well, it's like everybody else's book, you know, come up with something new. And it is difficult, I think, a lot of the time when you're so influenced by what you do read to come up with something new unless you have a brain that works that way in any case. Yeah. What I have noticed recently is, and I'm I'm quite enthused by it, I haven't been watching very much. Like we chatted about last time, um, I couldn't read at the beginning of lockdown and now I can't watch stuff and I can only read. It's a weird, I don't get it. So I'm not watching that much, but what I am watching, I'm seeing a lot of like really original stuff, Mm. like original stories. There was something I watched the other night and it was about um, two ambulance drivers. And I thought like, that's kind of a new, I haven't really seen a take on a story told from the the side of the ambulance drivers. And I think that we're getting in, in film and in series to new territory and Hopefully it's happening in fiction as well. Because if you think about TV and film like five years ago, ten years ago, a lot of it's the same formula. Mm. It's just on repeat with a different kind of storyline. They're not so much like really original stuff. I feel like now we're starting to get to the really original stuff. And, and Maybe that's why podcasts s- are so sticky as well. Podcasts have become because so sticky is because they're they're new, exactly, that everything feels kind of original and we, we're, we're all looking for original content. Sorry, I cut you off there. I didn't mean to. And I was just going to say that, um, you know, the, in, in writing, there haven't, hasn't really been a new genre, if we can call it that, in, in quite a while. I mean, if you think about it, we went through, you know, the classicals and then you went through the beat generation and it went through the whole sci-fi thing and then the chiclet thing came. And, and a lot yeah. of it had to do with the age <clears throat> of the writers at the time. Um, the, not yeah. their age, but the milieu in which they were writing. So, I mean, yeah. when was the last time that we had anything which was kind of like, wow, this is a totally different new style of writing, apart from look, when all the chiclet stuff started coming out? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm bashing my head around trying to think of stuff. But, I mean, the push was quite different by Ashley Audrain, but, you know, only maybe not so different in form, just different in writing. So, yeah, you're right. 
You're very right. I'm, I'm just currently what I'm busy reading now is um, Isle by Claire Robertson, mm-hmm. who's a South African author. I think this is her fourth. I'm a big fan. She's amazing. And it's a book told in two parts. And the first part is set in 1829. And it's written in, I don't even know how to describe it. It's almost written then. It's written as if it was then. It's almost another language. It's English, but it's not English. It's poetic. It's kind of old. And it's not old English. It's just kind of poetic English. And Mm -hmm. it's completely different to anything I've ever read. And you get it. You know, the the words don't make sense if you look at them. But when you read it, it makes absolute sense. It's just poetry. It's just written in a completely unique way. Mm. I don't know if that makes any sense. I don't really know how to describe it because I've never read anything quite like it before. And it's uh, set in an island uh, where um, a group of women live without men by choice. They're not quite nuns, but they're kind of affiliated to nuns, but they're not quite nuns. Yeah, and it's told in this really unique way. So that's the closest thing to something different that I've come across. But mm. you're right. I mean, the form is much the same. You know, it's like, you know, we went through the Mills and Boone phase as well. I suppose Chicklet might have come yes. out of that. And I see that yeah. uh, w- the woman that wrote Fifty Shades has come out with a new book as well, which I also will, will not read. <laughs> I missed that really recently. Yeah, it's on wow. its way out at the moment. Um, but. How do you feel when it comes to, I mean, do you listen to books or do you, are you very much a person, I need to have a book in my hand and read it? Or would you have one sitting and, and playing like off uh, your phone that you can listen to a book that's been read? Do you have a preference? I love book books. Um, I spend so much time on my computer that I can't, haven't quite mastered Kindle or, you know, reading on my phone or reading. My sister will read everything on her phone. Mm. Um, She's hilarious. So you'll find her standing looking at her phone and she's actually reading a whole book, pretending to talk to you, um, but she's actually looking at her phone and reading a book. Anyway, (laughs) but I can't do the on screen reading. Mm. So I'm very much because I think it's because I spend, you know, 12 hours a day in front of a computer. So I'm a bit ridiculous. But um, so I love a hardcover book, The Smell. I'm like that old fashioned thing. And then audible books, I'm crazy about audible books and podcasts because I walk and I run a lot and uh, cycle and from, and drive. If I'm driving, we just went away uh, the other day and we drove, you know, two hours. But um, my boyfriend was driving, we were in the car together and I was a little bit like resentful because if, at least if I drive by myself, I can listen to a book. <laughs> <laughs> but if, if he's driving, I couldn't really rope him into listening to a book. You know, he wants to chat or listen to the radio. So I listen to a lot of books on Audible and podcasts. And, and then I was wondering, I don't know if anyone's invented the technology yet so that you can listen to something while you're swimming. Does that exist? Mm. It should. Maybe they can play the sound underwater. <laughs> yeah, but not so easy in a public pool. <laughs> no, that's also true. <laughs> because that, that's, mo- you know, that's swimming, running, walking. You just want the company in your ears. Mm. I love listening to books. I absolutely love it. So those are my two favorite, but different times for different things, you know. Yeah. Um, driving, exercising, cleaning house is all audio books. And then every other time is, is book reading books. books. And I actually, with Miss Benson's Beetle, when um, I had to interview her and I was short on time, I had to read the book really quickly. So I was listening to it and reading it at the same time. So where I would be out walking or running and then I would listen to it. And then when I came back home, I would find where I was in the actual hardcover book, pick up where I was and, and read as well. So that was a gift. That was amazing. And what podcast do you listen to about writing and authors and books? Uh, well, The Guardian, anything that comes out of The Guardian, um, I'm listening to. I haven't been listening in a long time because I had a knee up. And mm-hmm. so I haven't been exercising. And so it's been about 10 weeks since I've been able to walk or run, sorry, a bit of a sob story. You didn't oh, ask shame. You didn't think when you were asking this question that you were going to get the sob story response. What did so you do to your knee, listening. Paige? Oh, I tore my meniscus and it was oh. miserable and it was awful. But oh. I'm coming right now. But I'm not able to walk or run or cycle or 
or or do um, housework yet. <laughs> That's my story and I'm sticking to it. Um, <laughs> so I haven't actually been listening to podcasts for about um, 10 weeks. So I'm a little behind on those recommendations, mm. if I'm okay. being completely honest. Well, you must let us know. Well, I mean, actually, you can put it all up on the Good Book Appreciation Society where people can go and yeah. listen to podcasts about good good books and good reading. Yeah, and maybe we need a Good Book Appreciation Society podcast. I think that's a fine idea. Come up with the idea and let's do it. Why not? And we'll tell everybody about it. Um, Okay. And have you got another book in you? I've got plans for another book to be writing one. I have started thinking about one. Just I'm not ready to put that kind of investment into writing. You know, once you decide to do – well, for me, I'm very all or nothing. Once I decide to write a a book – then I shut everything down and I write it and I don't stop until it's written. So it's an investment, it's a time investment and an energy investment and I'm not feeling like I have that right now. Mm. There are books that I want to write and I'm disappointed in myself that I haven't written them yet. Like the kinds of books that I I love to read aren't necessarily the books that I've written and that kind of irks me a little bit. I mean, I obviously love the books, you know, I'm proud of the books that I've written, but I'd like to move into a different kind of writing space. And maybe that's why I'm held up because I'm not quite there yet. So I know what kind of books I want to write. Uh, Just maybe I'm not good enough to write them yet. And I need to read more and think more before I can write those books. So I definitely think I've got more in me. I just can't imagine when. Well, let us know when it does come around, okay? <laughs> what about you? Do you do you think about writing a book? You must. Uh, not not fiction. I, I mean, I've got books on gardening. Yeah, you've got so, your books. Yeah, yeah. but um, yeah, there's but another you one go which. Into fiction. I'm I'm not that clever. No, oh, come on. I'm not that kind of clever. Let's put it that way. When I was a kid, I always thought, oh, I really, really want to write a book, and I'd love to be a published, yeah. you know, writer. I never yes. knew at the time that it would be about gardening. Okay, let's be honest about that. Um, but I, I appreciate other people's words. I, I like writing for other people. I like writing for television. I like writing articles. But I'm not really a novel writer. There's just too many clever, wonderful writers out there that I'd rather so appreciate. So would you do another gardening Oh, yeah, no, there's another definitely gardening. another gardening book or two, um, but they're actually written already because I overwrote yeah. for the first one. <laughs> so we've got another two which will come out. But they were nicely encapsulated into three parts. So we just have to see what the state of publishing is in, in South Africa at the moment uh, whether, as to whether well, it comes out or not. that's the other issue. Mm. Yeah, that's the other issue and maybe, you know, why I feel like I'm not writing right now. I just don't – I feel like other voices need the space and, um, yeah – because the time will we're come. In a difficult spot. You yeah. will know when it's right. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, Paige, it's so wonderful catching up with you. And um, yeah, let us know if you're keen on doing the Good Book Appreciation podcast. I think that would be fantastic. We should do that. Yeah, we let's do, do that. It. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. All right, and we'll catch up with you again later. In the meantime, everybody, please go out support authors. Even if you're buying the book on Audible or on Amazon, or if you're going to read it on your Kindle, go out. There's a lot of people who are putting some fantastic stuff out there, especially here in South Africa. Go out and support them. Paige, we'll speak to you again soon. Everybody, take good care. Bye-bye. You've been listening to another production from Solid Gold Podcasts.